Hi, everyone. Welcome to this edition of the Human Schools Curation Corner, just one part of our learning journey here at the Human School. I'm Randy. I'm Rachel. And I'm Chad. So in each episode, we engage in brief conversations focused on a specific resource. First, we summarize the author's ideas. Second, we make connections to our own experiences. And finally, we share insights and some additional questions that can further ours and hopefully your learning as well. In this episode, we're chatting about the article, Are We Transforming Our Education Systems Fast Enough to Save the Human Species? by Andy Culkins. If you're interested in the actual article, you can find a link below this video at thehuman.school. So what is Andy Culkins telling us? So a little context, the article is a recap of the Next Generation Learning Challenge 10th anniversary virtual celebration that happened virtually online in 2021 kicks off the article and their panel discussion with a question, which is the title of the article, are we transforming our education systems fast enough to save the human species? And the essence of the conversation was around this. We know what we need to do, and they give this time frame of 10 years, because there are lots of models. And we look back over the last 10 years, and we see more and more of the kinds of learning environments that we want, these humanized learning environments, we see more and more of them uh, becoming the common. Um, and that what we need to do now is we need to take action. And they finish the article with a quote that somebody said uh, on the virtual celebration. And that quote was, we have to be brave. So my connections are, um, around this idea of building to a tipping point where, where we have enough models that we have proof of concept. So a lot of the questions that we've been getting around the, the human school is, okay, great, great ideas, but where is this happening? And uh, so we have these questions here uh, on the human school. And then also I'll connect to a story uh, teaching a group of graduate students who are current practicing teachers and they were sharing how they're feeling unable to change the system that they're in their classrooms, the top down kinds of leadership that they're uh, sort of intertwined with. And at the end of all this sort of complaining um, and feeling frustrated, they didn't seem to have any sense that the vision that they have, the desire that they have for human centered classrooms and schools actually exist in places. So, I do wonder whether we're actually like getting these stories out there to the people that it will really resonate with. So that's a, a connection and a curiosity that I have. How about you guys? Yeah, I had a similar one too. And it's funny that you say that because I definitely have felt like that in many of our conversations, you know, you about having, oh, these things exist in places. And there's a little bit of an irony there too, because I started my job in one of those places, but I think I often felt like it was this anomaly that it didn't exist more than just there. Um, and so for me, one of the curiosities that kept coming up was around this conversation of systems. So often when we talk about systems, there's almost a negative uh, connotation to the word. Um, and so I was wondering, as I was reading, I was thinking similar to our compliance question is the idea of a system always a problem? Is it always negative? I think I often have an assumption that um, system is bad and that system prevents us from creating individualized, personalized, authentic experiences for people. But there are instances where systems make sense and are useful. So that was the thing that I kept thinking about that so many of the comments in the middle was about or about reforming or adjusting the system versus so many of our conversations are about transformation almost as if dropping the system is usually what i assume but it sounded to them less like an all or nothing and maybe that's my assumption um than it sometimes feels for me well i guess the, the one thing i would say is is i think that systems are are they are 
I mean, and Randy can push back on this and you can push back on this as well, Rachel, systems are just a reality. I think the question for me is how, how do we systematize a way of thinking that is driven by our mind shifts, driven by thinking with the human first, seeing everyone's capacity for leadership. So it's how do you systematize that thinking as opposed to what we currently have? So inherently, I don't think systems are bad um, because I see systems as made up of the humans and how the humans organize and structure. It's just that the one that we current have has become really acceptable and um, dehumanizing. So I, I, I guess my immediate gut reaction to your question, it's not that systems are inherently bad or evil. It's the people within it, what they're willing to, how they're willing to design and what they're willing to accept. Um, and so I think that's a really interesting question that you pose, Rachel, because I wonder how many people see just all systems as negative as, or positive versus, I don't know if you and, have any thoughts on that, Randy. The, the reason why people, I think, think about systems or certain systems as being negative is because if you ask the question of who, who are the people behind those systems, then I guess I'm not saying that right. So the, the challenge is, is that behind those systems, the people are not being are not being considered. So we're yeah. not asking when we design a system, here's what I'm trying to say, <laughs> thinking in the moment on Love a it. Sunday morning, when we design systems, we have to ask the question of who are the people behind the systems and how does the system serving the people? And when we have systems that we're unhappy with, it's because that question was never asked, who are the people behind the system? An example of that to me, Rachel, in our language is around curriculum design. And, you know, are you, are you, so there's both the question of who the curriculum serves, which are kids and learners. But then when you broaden that up another level, how much are teachers engaged in that processes? How much are principals, the people who are probably directly responsible for helping support teachers implement a strong curriculum with kids? You know, they use the language of guaranteed and viable and whatever that means. And that might be humanizing. It might be dehumanizing language, depending on your context. Um, so when Randy talks about, you know, it's not just who is the system designed for, but it's who's responsible or who's a part of that decision-making process. And I wonder, what it might be like for learners to be a part of a curriculum design process or parents, you know, go ahead. There's a part of me that keeps bouncing around this idea of whether or not though systems are almost inherently dehumanizing because the moment that you make it systemic, the moment that you systematize, and this is speaking in incredibly idealistic terms. I understand that there's a reality to it, but the moment that you do that, it, it's almost standardized, right? When we think about systematized, that more often than not, when we create something systemic and systematized, I think that there's a correlation between system and standard. I, I, push back I don't on know that. that they have to be, but I feel like they tend to be. So if we systematized kindness as a part of our culture, does it make it less kind because we've said that we've made an intentional decision, that we've given people agency over how they show kindness or when they show kindness or what that looks like, but we've created a system in which kindness is at the heart of what we do. Does that make it a less kind system? Because we've intentionally said, this is a thing we're going to focus on and we're going to create structures to ensure that that happens. I guess I don't necessarily, and maybe I'm just wrong. Um, there's no but, wrong. It's a great conversation. Sometimes there's wrong. Um, but I don't think of systems in that way. I guess when I think about systemic and education, it is public schools, these grades, these students, this rate, this amount of time, this hierarchy, administrator, supervisor, da, 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 da. So to me, that's system. But couldn't, you design, but couldn't you design a system in which those people that you just described have agency within it to design a, a schedule, to design a bell schedule, to design curriculum, to, to design feedback opportunities? The system is the thing that creates the consistency and the thinking 
it doesn't have to be those parts. Like I see those interchangeable parts as being the things that are informed by the people who make up the system. And I go back to my question of who's behind the system. And I think in the example of the school system that you gave, Rachel, people aren't behind that system. Nobody's designed that system with people in mind. The kindness example, yeah, that's a value, that's a belief, that's something that we wanna focus on, that's something that we wanna be known for. Let's build intentionality around that so that it becomes part of the human-centered system that we're designing and living within. So, so I bring this article ahead, back to, um, sorry, you were frozen there for a second. <laughs> Did you have something else that you wanted to add, Chad? No, I was just, the only little nugget I was going to add is that the one caution I have with an article like this is when they, they talk about this sense of urgency, which I totally agree with. I've been around leaders who have chosen the word urgency and turned it into chaos. <laughs> and, um, and again, the humanness of that work is really important that we don't interpret urgency for doing to others. And I've seen many leaders say, this is something that has to get done. And then they've turned around and done it in completely dehumanizing ways. Even though the goal or the intention was good, it's not what we do. It's how we do it is a phrase that I always do. So the best possible thing, like personalized learning is a great, wonderful thing to go to. But if you do that in the most depersonalized and dehumanized way, you're never going to get there with teachers or kids. So I think that while I 1000% agree with this sense of urgency, we cannot eliminate or give up the human elements that makes that change likely to happen for people. Sorry, I just wanted to share that. Go ahead. No, it's a, it's a great insight. And so what I love about these conversations is we can take the same resource and approach it from different perspectives. And so... I'm going to bring this back to my insight around this article, which relates to our storytelling compass points. And that is that the importance of stories, because stories inspire and they provide hope at a time that we need inspiration to do the heavy lifting of transforming this education system. And it makes me wonder, are we getting the stories out there that need to happen to save our planet, to save our species, as they like to say? Right. I think a lot about where our students are in that conversation. My initial thought was making sure that we're asking ourselves, what is it we want for them? And then I rethought that, that that's still from someone to someone and it doesn't include them in the conversation. So I think that doesn't mean that's not something we should ask ourselves, but there should also be another step to it of what is it that students want for themselves and how can we create space for that in order for them to get what they want in order for us to support them in their growth and in their development without necessarily putting on them our expectations and our demands of who they should be or what they should learn. Well, Rachel, to your point, you know, when you, you did a wonderful job of kind of restating that in a way that, that brings the learner into it. Uh, the question I have is why do we as adults know better? That's a thing that I hear people say all the time. Well, I'm an adult. I know better. I know what they need. I know they need to learn this or they need to learn that or they, and there is almost a lack of objectorship um, even in saying that as a, you know, 42 year old man, I know exactly what a 14 year old needs yeah, I've been a 14 year old and I have some expertise because I taught for many, many years, but I think it's still a really arrogant sentiment that I know exactly what each kid in my classroom needs. So um, I'll just share real quickly, um, you know, I, I, my big connection is really around um, this idea of embracing the future instead of ignoring it, because so many of our systems are built around this, this kind of archaic model of, of teaching as opposed to a modern uh, model of learning. And so not only are we, are we kind of stuck in the past, we're not even addressing our current present, just to Rachel's point. And I think that we're completely ignoring our future. And so I wonder how we can help people to recognize that these, even these small, small choices we make, they can lead us to a, a deeper uh, future orientation. All right. Well, hopefully by listening to our conversation and maybe in the future, even coming on and engaging with us in this conversation, you can see how the human school compass can be a lens 
through which we can look at all sorts of things about our education system. So to close this out, uh, we shared our insights and there are some questions for you to think about and for us as well. How are we sharing stories about the work we're doing to transform the education system to save the human species? What do we want for our students? What do we have to create and what space do we have to leave to let that happen? How do we balance a sense of urgency with a deeper understanding of human need for a change to be at one's own pace? Thanks for learning alongside us on this episode of the Human Schools Curation Corner. Visit thehuman.school and its Learning in Public Hub for additional resources and join the conversation in our Facebook community committed to placing humanity at the center of all design. Good to chat with you too, and Good we'll see, see everybody soon. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye -bye. Bye, guys.